uh, go to Representative Carnevale. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion at this time to hold all bills for further study. Motion by Representative second. Carnevale, second by Representative uh, Norton, Representative Hull, Representative Ruggiero, Representative Barrows, and Representative um, uh, Marshall. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Carnevale. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first bill we will hear tonight is House Bill 7121 by Representative Ruggiero, authorizes Middletown to issue up to $5 million in bonds for street and sidewalk improvements. Representative? Thank you, Vice Chair Carnevale and Chairman Gallison and members of the House Finance. Uh, H7121 does just that, authorizing uh, the town of Middletown to do street repairs, sidewalks, construction, paving, and uh, drainage. It is not to exceed $5 million. This is to go on the ballot in November and will be voted on uh, by the people of Middletown. So that's the bill before us. Is there any questions by committee members? No commission, no questions by committee members. And there is no one from the general public to testify, and that completes the hearing on 7121. Thank you. Next bill we will hear is House Bill 7013 by Representative Chippendale. Representative Chippendale? Thank you, Chairman, and uh, esteemed members of the Finance Committee. What I am uh, offering with this bill is an opportunity for us to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, way, way back when, good old King George in 1764 proposed that uh, Brown University uh, professors uh, would be able to exercise a tax exemption on their personal homes up to $10,000. Um, and then that was adopted into Rhode Island general laws. The chapter is in front of you. It's 4433. Uh, about, I want to make sure I get the date correct. Uh, in 1965, Brown University went on the record and voluntarily uh, took it upon themselves to have their professors sign a waiver so that they would not take advantage of this. There were some who were grandfathered in, but... I, and I have a, a document from Brown that I will disseminate. I'll give it to the clerk to disseminate to you guys. Um, it's, a, it's a press release that came out again in 1995 where Brown uh, reflected on uh, how they abandoned this tax break 30 years prior, which was 1965. And uh, they just reiterate in their press release that, that there are no longer anyone, any uh, members of their staff taking advantage of this. And they actually asked cities and towns to please remove it from their tax bills because they were getting a lot of grief. People were calling up and saying, you know, why the heck is Brown getting a break when, you know, uh, they just were getting too many phone calls about it. It wasn't something that they, that they practiced anymore, and they asked the towns to do that. So we still have this statute sitting on the books. So I think uh, in accordance with not only their demands to, to abandon it and get rid of it, and then also just a, a, a way to tighten up what is often referred to as a blue law, uh, we can just eradicate this section, which is uh, uh, page 2, section uh, lines 19 through 22 on the bill. And uh, it's very, very simple. It's, it's worded uh, very concisely, and it just scratches them. So again, it's just an opportunity for us to clean up our statutes, get something out there that's not in use, and uh, may or may not be causing uh, some grief to certain cities and towns and their tax collectors, and certainly the university themselves. Um, and with that, I take questions if there are any. Representative Hall. Uh, thank you, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, did Brown approach you on this bill? No, sir. Actually, the uh, town fathers in Foster, they did. The, the town council approached me. Um, and they recognized that this was still on the books. Uh, there are, was no one, of course, taking uh, advantage of it in town, so it wasn't an issue, a fiscal issue for the town. But they did send me a resolution uh, seeking to uh, bring it to my attention and, and to, to see what could be done, and, and quite simply just striking it was the only thing that can be done because they don't <laughs> use it, we don't need it. So let's, let's get rid of it. And you don't know if anybody in the state is using it? Uh, according to Brown's own uh, <coughs> release, no. At first, when in 65, when they stopped, they grandfathered in the professors uh, or a certain amount of the professors who were using it. 
Um, but th they've long since uh, expired in their residency in Rhode Island. So there is no one currently using it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Bless you. Any other questions? <coughs> Representative Chippendale, a couple of quick questions. Sure. Let me just a couple of statements. And uh, let me say I, I admire your goal with this, because I think you understand and you realize that my fight is what my fight and my battle has been with the alleged nonprofit tax exempts. Of course. Um, my research contradicts that and says there is one person receiving the break. Okay. It's an elderly man, but the break is about $200 a year. That's all. Okay, I was completely unaware of that. It says it's about $200 a year. I haven't seen the paperwork that, on that, but that's what I've been told. Uh, but that's not the problem, I'm, the, the position I'm worried about. <laughs> what I'm worried about is in 2003, there was an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, signed between the City of Providence and, and the University. tax exempts. <clears throat> and one part of that states that there is a transitional parcels payment that the tax exempts would make to the City of Providence. And this MOU that started in 2002 ends in 2020. Excuse me, started in 2003, ends in 2023. Okay. They also, and, the, and those are done in, the percentage of the payments on those are made in five-year increments for 15 years. There's also what is called a voluntary payment, which is made for the total 20 years of this 2003 MOU. In 2012, there was a second MOU signed between the city and uh, the tax exempts, and primarily Brown and Johnson and Wales this time. And this does another form of payments in lieu of taxes for those two universities. Uh, the dollar amount is the same from 2012 to 2016, 2017 to 2022. It also ends 2022. There's also a street conveyance and a parking stipulation. I'm not an attorney, but there is a section in there I, I remember that states that if there are changes made and taxes are implemented, or and I know we're not implementing taxes on them, but there are changes made to it, it goes into a situation where the memorandum of understanding could be null and void. So my only concern is, and I'm, once again, I'm not an attorney, I'm not sure if this pertains to that, but for the $200 a year, I would be hesitant to support this where the city could lose millions of dollars. I would, I would agree 100% with that. And I'm not sure. And once again, I admire what you're doing, believe me, but I, I'm just not sure if that falls into this or... So well, I, I certainly will research. Uh, absolutely research because, first of all, I, as I stated so so firmly uh, there was no one still on it evidently there is um, so my research fell a little short on that so not only will I uh, double check on that but I also will uh, determine have it determined by the legal folks uh, what impact if any there would be on the MOU um, or the SE or any of the uh, any of that um, in with the city and uh, the university or the nonprofits um, because yeah I don't I wouldn't want to uh, I'm certainly not trying to harm Providence or any, any town from non-exempts. I know pilot monies have been an issue for several towns, and, and certainly, uh, um, if anything, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I can uh, just uh, make it so that this may not ever pop up in the future by, by eradicating an, an unused law. But if, I, uh, if, if by chance this would do harm, I will, I will find that out and um, either withdraw or advise the committee su as such. Thank you, Representative Chippendale. Any other questions? None? Rep, thank you. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. You too. Yes, Representative Morgan. Um, I wasn't here. Can I be uh, recorded as, what am I doing? <laughs> Affirmative in, in holding it for further study. Thank you, Representative Morgan. Thank Click, you. you see that? The next bill we will hear is, uh, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, you are correct, Representative. Mr. Randall Rose. Good evening, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, first time I've seen these new buttons. Um, makes it easier to remember which way is on and which way is off. Okay, good. Um, so, um, 
The original charter of Brown University that King George um, granted um, said that the university pays no taxes and the professors pay no taxes. Um, and that, um, that's been modified since then. Um, in the 1800s, there was an effort to, um, to, by the legislature to change the part that said um, that the professors pay no taxes. And what ended up happening is the upshot of that was um, a compromise was reached um, because Brown was saying this charter Charter is inviolable. The legislature can't interfere with it. The legislature can't tax um, it when the charter says you can't. Um, but a compromise was reached, and um, Brown ended up um, voluntarily amending its charter um, to say that um, that um, professors um, would. Um, enjoy a tax break only for the first $10,000 of their property. $10,000 went further in the 1800s than it does now, of course. But um, they enjoyed a tax break for only the first $10,000 of, of the property. So I checked the charter, and the charter has, in fact, been amended um, from the original version. And that was the result of pressure from the legislature. Um, in theory, um, Brown, does, um, the, Brown claims that it's um, not subject to any laws that want to change the charter, but in practice, Brown gave in, and they reached this compromise. Um, so that's how that compromise came about, about the first $10,000. So if a um, professor is subject to tax, um, then um, they will only pay the taxes on the first $10,000, which I guess amounts to $200, um, given what the um, chair was saying before. So, um, the, um, so it's... Um, so it's an interesting legal situation. Brown's legal theory that they um, cannot, that this cannot be changed by the legislature has not been tested in court. Um, and when it came to the possibility of testing it in court, they ended up backing down and making this compromise back in the 1800s. Um, I think it would be. Uh, I think um, as a matter of apart from the legal dispute, as a matter of policy, whether it's good policy to give this tax exemption, I think nobody is defending it as a matter of policy. Nobody thinks it is good policy for Brown professors to enjoy this tax exemption that nobody else does. Um, and the, um, so Brown would have a very hard time defending it in the court of um, public opinion or trying to use it as leverage. Um, the, um, now, it's true that, that now if you have this – Brown did have this kind of poison pill in the MOU that says if the, their tax situation changes, then the MOU is null and void. Um, but, of course, their legal theory says they, they can't be forced to do the things in the MOU anyway, but um, in practice they end up making these concessions. Um, so the um, – so I think that um, it, um, if, if – um, let's just game this out. Suppose that um, – suppose we pass this and suppose Brown decides to take umbrage and say, no, you can't take this off the books even though it's hardly being enforced um, and um, we're going to tear up the MOU and refuse to comply with it. Um, I don't think they'd be able to defend that in the court of uh, public opinion at all because um, the public has long since concluded that there is no way to defend this um, tax break um, given to, um, to um, Brown professors, and Brown themselves are not trying to um, defend it on the merits, um, and it doesn't affect Brown's bottom line in any way. So if you pass this law, even if Brown's legal theory was correct, they wouldn't be able to do anything about it. They would have to keep on complying with the MOU in any case. That's how I read the situation, um, and I think this is good pol policy to be begin with, it's, um, it's time for the state law to stop deferring to this bad legal theory um, and start reflecting what the practice is and what is good um, policy in any case. So I'm supporting this bill. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Are there any questions of Mr. Rose? Mr. Rose, just one statement. If you read the MOUs of 2003 and 2013, excuse me, 2012, they both explicitly state that they are non-binding. Yes. Thank okay. You. Sometimes non-binding MOUs are the ways that things get done in effect. But I understand your point. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Rose. We will now hear Bill 70111, Representative Solomon, authorizes a Rocky Point license plate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Old Bill Committee. Uh, I'm here on uh, the Rocky Point license plate bill which would essentially create a license plate uh, for the Rocky Point, and uh, it would, the proceeds, uh, it, would be, it would be a $40 surcharge for the plate, and $20 of that would go straight to the Rocky Point Foundation, which has done some amazing things over at Rocky Point, and then the other $20 uh, would go to the state. And uh, last year, this bill passed the House, uh, passed the, actually this committee, passed the House of Representatives, uh, there was also a Senate equivalent, a duplicate bill, which passed the Senate, but unfortunately, due to the last days of session, uh, you know, uh, all the bills, you know, with all the bills and whatnot. 
passing. But, um, you know, I, I just want to also show you uh, some of the designs for the plates. So uh, I showed these designs for the plates last year. Uh, the technical, technical school in Warwick, uh, they actually had a competition where the kids designed the individual plates. So there's plenty of plates over here. And uh, they would definitely open it up to uh, other designs as well. So I think it's something that's great uh, that would benefit the Rocky Point Foundation, all the great work that they've been doing over at Rocky Point. You know, I'm not sure if you've had the opportunity to go tour it, but it's absolutely beautiful down there. So thank you. If you have any questions. Are there any questions? Seeing that there are none, that ends the uh, hearing on House Bill 7011. Thank you, Representative. We now hear two bills by Representative Filippi. Is Representative Filippi here? No, he's not here. We'll do that last. Representative Riley, Bill 7188 and 7189. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, would you like me to just testify on both bills while I'm up here? If you could, please. Perfect. Um, so, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, seven, House Bill 7188 um, uh, is a new bill that I introduced this year for the first time. Uh, that would create a special House study commission to study uh, the awarding, implementation, and management of state contracts, with a particular emphasis on construction contracts. The impetus of this bill, or the genesis of this bill, I should say, uh, has to do with the Department of Transportation and nothing terribly recent, but I would say over a long-standing history with a lot of pro problems that have surfaced after projects have been completed and a lot of costly litigation that the state has had to deal with as a result of projects that also result in shoddy workmanship. This isn't a bill to go after DOT or contractors. This bill is to look at the entire process. How do we award contracts? How much do we spend on consultants to review those contracts? Um, could we achieve efficiencies, for example, at DOT or at DOA when we do large capital projects by bringing more work in-house as opposed to farming it out to outside consulting firms? Those are all different questions that I think could be addressed uh, or answered by a study commission led by the House with a broad mandate to look at contracts in general. Uh, and, and that is 7188. 7189 is a bill that I introduced last year along with Representative Marshall. Uh, this is a study commission to look at all of the state real estate in the Capital Center District. Uh, the, re the, the idea behind this bill is that there have been a lot of studies done, particularly on this building, by administrations, both the current one and administrations past, Whenever we're looking for improvements to the state house or to other state buildings, we're always told that something's being looked at, architects have been hired, we've appropriated a lot of money. This commission would not be hiring architects, tasking engineers to look at problems. We would be getting DOA to take all of those plans off the shelves and to figure out what our long-term needs as a legislative body are for real estate as well as for different government departments. The uh, one issue came up last year with wording the Capital Center District and putting that in the title of the legislation. The reason behind that is because there's a lot of state-owned property, as you, you, Mr. Chairman, are well aware. Uh, around the State House, we felt that legally the best way of describing all of that in, in, in a simple sentence would be describing the property within the Capital Center. The only thing I would add to that is that um, I have had discussions, very preliminary discussions with the Secretary of State staff with regards to um, improvements at the State Archives, that there there were some news reports on last year, and I understand her administration is working uh, on, on improvements there, what they would do. This type of commission would absolutely look at that. How much real estate do we have? Can we build a new archives? Can we incorporate that in existing buildings we may own? And uh, to that end, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, um, I would just add that this is a House commission with uh, five members from the House of Representatives and five members to be appointed uh, by tenants in the building. So the head of JCLS or their designee, as well as um, the lieutenant governor, the governor, and the, uh, the secretary of state, as well as the treasurer 
uh, would make up the remaining uh, appointees. So everyone who has a stake in the state house uh, and has offices or space here would have a seat at the table so everyone could be involved. Uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. Thank you, Representative. Are there any questions for Representative Riley? Seeing that there are none, that ends the hearing on House Bills 7188 and 7189. Uh, yes, Representative. Chairman, if you could please uh, put me in the affirmative on uh, the holding for further hold study. Clerk, you see that? Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would also like to be recorded in the affirmative for, uh, to hold the bills for further study. Clerk, you see that? Thank you, Representative Jerusa. Next bill we will hear is House Bill 7078, Representative Price. Thank you, Chairman, committee members. How's it going? <laughs> this is a this is a town bill that um, that uh, addresses the uh, um, extra West Greenwich School District requiring requiring the the uh, quorum the quorum requirements um, and uh, also the conduct of the all day referendum. Um, <clears throat> it also addresses the and changes extending the payment schedule um, for the for the uh, town to give the money to the local school districts and uh, I'm waiting for the town resolutions and when I receive them I'll forward them to the committee thank you representative are there any questions for representative price seeing that there are none that ends the testimony on host bill 7078 and representative I apologize for the delay I didn't see you in attendance oh no thank you chairman I understand Good night. Good night. Next bills we will hear. Representative Flippy. Host bills 7238 and 7239. 7238 requires City and Town Council, School Committee, Zoning Boards to make audio and video recordings of all open meetings. And 739 requires all public bodies within state government and all quasi-state agencies to make audio and video recordings of all open meetings. Good evening, Representative Flippy. Good evening, Chairman. It's nice to be back in front of finance. I think the room is beautiful. What inspired me to do these bills, frankly, is the camera that I'm looking at right now, the cameras we have on the floor of the House and the Senate. I think the House and the Senate are models of open government. All of our committee meetings are either audio or video recorded and published to the Internet for public consumption. You can sign on to the Internet at any time and watch these committee hearings and floor debates on demand. I believe that the executive branch should be operating with the same level of transparency that we operate, and I believe that our town councils, our school committees, and our zoning boards should also be operating with the same level of transparency. Many families work, both parents work, they have to take care of their children, and they might not be able to attend meetings of executive branch agencies, quasi-publics, or their local, their local governments, and I think that's a problem. I think people should be able to sign on to the Internet and watch these proceedings at any time. I don't have a fiscal note for this year, but this bill was submitted last year, and there's a fiscal note, I believe, from last year, which was given to everybody, and we determined that it would cost approximately $495,000 to outfit all 45, excuse me, 55 state agencies and quasi-publics with adequate video and audio equipment to do this. And, and it's, it's really economical now because you have companies like Google and YouTube who've spent billions of dollars inventing the perfect methods of streaming video. So what maybe 15 to 20 years ago we couldn't have done because it would have cost a lot of money to develop these systems, the private market has already developed these systems now. So what our bill allows is to utilize this new technology by authorizing the Secretary of State to upload it to a, a video streaming service that uh, is commonly used to stream videos. So I think we should take advantage of the technology the private industry has put out there and, and open up the other branches of government like we are. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Representative Filippi. Are there any questions for the Representative? Representative Jerusa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rep Filippi, is this only recorded or is this, is this also live video? So th this is not live. This is... Uh, this, this is to do the streaming capabilities. I think would would be onerous on, on our municipalities and our, our 
quasi-publics and agencies. So what this requires is that within 48 hours, that recorded audio and video data has to be transferred to the Secretary of State, and then within one business day, the Secretary of State would have to publish it to the Internet for public consumption. Well, I think it's a great idea, because I don't know if everybody got a chance to open it up yet, but uh, we all received an email today from Rhode Island College from the president, and it was a, a YouTube uh, note just to tell us what's going on in the school and all that, and I thought it was brilliant, and I like your idea a lot. Well, I'm happy our public universities are on the cutting edge. Thank you, Representative Russo. Thank you, Representative Russo. Any other questions? Seeing that there are none, thank you, Representative Filippi. Thank you, Chairman. We have one person who has signed up to testify in this, and that's Mr. Rose, Mr. Randall Rose. You may testify on both pieces of legislation. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, so I'm here to support this bill. Um, actually, an organization I belong to, Operation Clean Government, I believe they gave you a letter supporting these, um, this pair of bills. Um, so I, I do, um, but I'm here to speak on my own behalf um, for um, these pair, these two bills. Um, so. I just want to say, if there are any concerns about cost, um, I think um, Representative Filippi has addressed some of them by saying that the um, fiscal impact is um, about 500, is about half a million dollars um, to um, to outfit each of the relevant um, facilities with um, video recording equipment. Um, on the other hand, if even that is a concern, um, I think this could be done. It's perfectly possible to comply with this law for zero cost. Um, the um, with, uh, because um, any modern iPad or um, most laptops or, or smartphones um, already have the capability to record video, um, not perhaps as good quality as this video, but perfectly adequate quality. Um, so if any municipality is, um, or anybody is worried about the cost of doing so, they can just ask one of their employees, why don't you use your iPad or your smartphone or your laptop to record the video, um, and that's good enough. Um, so the cost is really minimal, and um, this is um, um, this, um, it might be a little more if you want to do really good quality, but that's not necessary. The important thing is to make this information available online, which is um, what the public expects, um, and it, is, um, it has a lot of advantages if you want to um, post information uh, on your Twitter feed about what you said at this or that hearing. Um, this makes it possible to do that, and you can communicate with your constituents in that way, um, and um, it's, um, it makes this a lot easier than if um, the, um, there's no recording collected. Um, so I think this is, uh, um, I think it benefits the public, it benefits um, elected officials and other officials, and I think it's um, just something that's needed for transparency. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Are there any questions for Mr. Rose? Seeing that there are none, Mr. Rose, thank you for your testimony. The hearings on House Bill 7238 and 7239 have ended. Those are Representative Filippi's House Bills. The last bill we hear today is House Bill 7122 by Representative Lancia. Good evening, Representative. Good evening, Chairman. Um, this bill that I put in this evening uh, that you're looking at, uh, what I was asked by um, Mr. Joseph Gemma of the Gloria Gemma Foundation to put it in. Um, as you all would know, normally, it takes 900 license plates, a little plus, to uh, actually get a plate. And I know how long it took. My wife has the uh, Gloria Gemma passenger plate on her car. I know how many years it took to get that. Mr. Gemma approached me at the Flames of Hope weekend and it said, is it possible that we could uh, amend the bill specifically for Gloria Gemma where it would be a total of 900 plates, both commercial and passenger? Um, and he has 200 trucks already that he's ready to put these plates on in addition. Now, we've already reached the threshold for the 900 for the passenger, obviously, but rather than have to wait for another 900, he was hoping it might be possible, and I told him I would put the bill on on his behalf. I mean, uh, my wife's here with me. For me, the whole Gloria Gemma issue, the work they do, I know Representative Norton uh, signed on to the bill, and I thank you so much for doing that, as did Representative Diaz, Representative Ackerman, and Representative Phillips. 
But, um, you know, it's personal for my wife and I. We had a young woman that used to be in my youth group, and, you know, she called me up. She was getting chemo. She was going to be going under surgery, and she called me up and asked me if I would baptize her because I'm an ordained minister. And I called my home church, and we baptized her. And so it's a very personal issue for me, and they, they do so much good work. If there's some way that we could help them out in this respect, I did have a member of the DAV, uh, excuse me, DMV, uh, approach me yesterday as I was entering the chamber, and we are talking about, how much of an issue it would be to create an additional, say, 200 plates, what costs would be involved. That I don't know or how difficult it would be, um, and he was going to give me a little bit more information on that. But on the surface, if it's possible, I, I think it's it's a feel-good legislation. I mean, it, it's important for those people. I mean, when you talk to these people and what they've been through, if there's a possibility to do that, I mean, they take over the state house, as you know, each year. And in addition, I've also... Uh, given a letter to the governor, uh, one of the other, Larry Jem had asked me if it was possible we could, the governor would be willing to contact the other 49 states to light up their houses, their state houses, at the same time we light ours up in October. It'd be, what, it'd be phenomenal, too. So th that was approached separately by both, and I sent a letter to the governor on one, and I put this bill in for the other. But uh, if it's doable or possible, again, he's ready to put 200 additional plates on his commercial vehicles in addition to, uh, obviously, we already have the 900 threshold for passenger. So that's basically the bill. Um, that I put in on his behalf. Great. Thank you, Representative. Are so, there any questions for Representative Lancia? Seeing that there are none, Representative, thank you for your time. Thank evening. you so much. Thank you, everyone. And that ends the hearing on House Bill 7122. There are no other bills to be heard tonight. Do you have a motion to adjourn? Motion by Representative Norton. All in favor? House Finance Committee has adjourned.